take it away. All right. So good morning, everyone. So I know you guys are reading the book, um, Journey of the Soul. So I know that you've gotten, um, if you've read the chapter on meditation, you have a kind of general idea of what meditation is. And hopefully today we'll just dig a little bit deeper and then get a chance to practice it as well. So we're going to actually do a meditation this morning as well. So let's get going. So first, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. This is my family. Um, so like Otoma said, I have four children. Their ages are 25, 22, 13, and 11. So we're never bored at our house. We always have something going on with four boys. And this is my husband, Tyrone. And um, one thing I just wanted to say about meditation and the practice of meditation. So I grew up in Northern Vermont, right up on the Canadian border. You could actually see Canada from my house. Um, so it snowed about eight months of the year, actually. <laughs> so we're talking about snow. It was crazy up there. But um, I first got introduced to meditation when I was in high school. One of my high school uh, teachers actually did meditation with us, teaching us about just health and wellness and just being able to take care of ourselves. And so they taught meditation as part of that. Meditation is not my normal space at all. It is not my character is one that is just do, 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 do. Let's go. Let's go. Let's make things happen. Let's, I feel like I have to be productive. I feel like I have to get stuff done. I feel like if I'm not, then something's wrong with me. Um, I'm not one to watch lots of TV or anything like that, because I just feel like I have to go, 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 go. That is my normal space. Um, so meditation, I remember even in high school, when I first tried it, I thought, wow, this is an amazing space. I never would have found this space on my own. <laughs> I definitely needed somebody to introduce me to this space, um, but I loved it. I loved how it made my body feel just calm and relaxed. And, and I loved how it made my mind feel that I could be intentional about where I put my focus. It wasn't going all over the place and needing to get stuff done, um, but I could really be, just be focused on being still. And I really enjoyed what that did for me. Um, and it helped me in lots of other ways, like helped me to focus on, on not just feeling like I have to get everything done, but what is one thing I can focus on getting done right now and feel good about that. And so I would say right from the get-go, meditation was something that uh, just piqued my interest because of how different it was from my sort of natural state. So I would just say that in the beginning, just to say that if meditation feels unnatural to you, it's okay. <laughs> um, because after, you know, I'm 50 now. So however many years that is from high school till now, I, I can. That's so young. That is so young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can very easily, once I start meditation, very easily go to that place now. Uh, it feels comfortable now. I, I look forward to it. If I miss my time of meditation, I, I crave it now. <laughs> so even though it wasn't my natural state, and if it's not your natural state, that's okay. Um, if you continue to practice it, you might find that it that it becomes a place you very much want to be. Um, and that it brings you a piece that you can't find in other ways. So um, I would say just persevere if it feels like it's not natural, because in the long run, it would definitely be worth it. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is the condition of your well? So when we think about a well, we, we don't think about these pictures, right? We think about water splashing everywhere. <laughs> we think about it being full. We think that's what we think of when we think of a well. But sometimes our wells get, get stopped up, right? Uh, sometimes people have uh, put stuff in them. Sometimes we have put stuff in them. Sometimes we have not taken care of our well and it starts to overgrow like these pictures. And I think it's really important to just pay attention to our spiritual well. If we're starting to feel like our spiritual well is getting low or it's getting dry or it's starting to have, you know, getting overgrown like these pictures, then a couple of things happen. What This is what I've noticed. A couple of things happen. One, we start to get anxious. We start to get anxious because if someone asks us to do something or if we think we should be doing something or we think something would be good for us to be doing, we start to 
get anxious about whether or not we're going to have enough to do that, right? Because when the well is nearly empty and you think about drawing from it, two things happen. One, we're not sure there's going to be enough to, to be able to do whatever it is we want to do. And we it takes a lot more effort to do it, right? So if you dropped a bucket down a well that didn't have very much water in it, you'd have to drop the bucket all the way to the bottom of the well and you'd have to pull it all the way back up. So it actually takes more effort to pull from a well that doesn't have much in it. And so taking a moment right now and just kind of think for yourself, when I think about my spiritual well, what does it look like right now? Does it does it look like it's full and overflowing? Does it look like it's half full? Does it look like one of these pictures here where it's really overgrown and it's dried up? And so if it is, we're going to do some things about that. So one of the things that one of the ways that I think about this and I think about all of the spiritual disciplines or practices, I actually call them practices. I call them spiritual practices because nobody likes the word discipline at all. <laughs> um uh, we have such negative connotations with discipline, but I also think spiritual practices sends us the message that we're going to have to practice this, um, that it's something that we are going to need to practice. And when we, when it's something we need to practice, we don't expect we're going to be perfect at it the first time. So if we have to practice riding a bike or we have to practice uh, learning to do a new class at the gym or whatever it might be. We have to practice learning to play the flute. We have to practice learning something. We don't expect that we're going to pick it up and be perfect the first time. We expect that each time we practice, we're going to get a little bit better at it, but that we're going to keep practicing it. And the more we practice, the more comfortable we get with it, the more um, pr proficient we become at that thing. And so just kind of think about all of the spiritual disciplines you're learning about different ones each week reading this book, that each of them are just uh, ways that we can practice walking with God. We can practice being with God. And so one of the questions I always think of when I think of the spiritual disciplines is I think, what do I do when I feel like my well is running low or running dry? What do I do when I feel like that power source is getting low? So what do you do with your phone when your phone starts to lose power? Do you, you know, your phone gets to 5% power. Do you just shut it down, leave it on the table and say, you know what, it'll be fine. It just needs a little rest and then I'll come back tomorrow and it'll work great. We don't do that, right? Why do we not do that? Because what would happen? We'd come back the next day and it would still be at 5% or even less, actually, because of all the apps we have going, you continue to drain it, right? Um, so just powering down doesn't doesn't help our phone to, to be optimal and help it to work well the next day. It doesn't do that for us either. So for us to pay attention to that, it's not, we don't want to just power down when we start to feel overdrawn. We want to learn actually how to power up. So just like our phone, we have to plug in our phone to a power source. We have to get the right cord. I know my husband and I have different phones. He's an Apple guy. I'm an Android girl. And, and we, I can't use his power cord, right? I have to use my own. And we, then we have to be able to plug in to the power source. And we have to do the same thing spiritually. When you start to feel like you're needing a recharge, then it's important that you have the right cord. And it's important that you plug into the right source. And sometimes things that that we do to kind of settle ourselves or to, I just need to unplug. Um, and we, we kind of do things, maybe we have a glass of wine, we watch TV, we do all these things. Those things are not evil or bad in and of themselves. But when we do them to think that it's going to recharge us, I think that's where it becomes an issue. Um, so just understand that those things are not things that are going to fill you up because you haven't plugged into a power source. So all of the spiritual practices uh, that you're learning from this book are all ways that you can, they're all, I think of them as cords. They're cords that connect us to the power source. And so we're just gonna, the cord itself is not the power. The cord is what connects you to the power. So the power is God. The power has been God all along. The power still is God now. God is the one who's gonna refill you, recharge you. He's gonna get that well. So it's overflowing, uh, but we have to use the right cord to connect to him. And so the spiritual practices are just these cords that connect us 
to that power source. And today we're just looking at the the cord of meditation, okay? Just like all the other ones that you've you've looked at, Sabbath and whatnot, they're just ways to connect to that power source. So the first question is to ask yourself, are you plugged in? Are you using the right cords and are you plugged in? So meditation. So the first thing, the, one of the biggest questions I usually get about meditation. So I did my my doctoral work, my doctoral research in using Christian meditation to help clients who are experiencing anxiety, depression, or shame. And it showed that it decreases to anxiety, depression, and shame. But it also showed something I felt was even more important. It showed that it increases resiliency. And so it increases a person's connection to God. It increases their, their sense of feeling that grace is available to them, their ability to connect to other people, their ability to feel self-efficacy, they can feel good about themselves, uh, that, med- that practicing Christian meditation in the research that I did actually showed that in my clients. It showed that all of those things increased um, as they practiced Christian meditation. And so the first thing, but but people will ask, I don't know if I can do meditation because we have sort of this this view of meditation from what we see in the world around us. And it's not necessarily seen as Christian in the world around us. So we get a little bit frightened by that. Just like Atoma, you said in the beginning, we get a little frightened by counseling as well as Christians, um, because we're afraid these things are actually going to pull us away from God. And I would propose that one, practicing meditation is biblical, and we're going to look at that, um, that you don't ever have to step outside the Bible and still practice meditation, um, that is actually commanded in the Bible that we meditate. So uh, it, it is, in fact, biblical. And I would say also from the counseling perspective, if you find a counselor who can understand your faith and who can help you understand that your faith is a strength for you, then it can be an incredible a companion to the the counseling strategies that are out there today. And those of us who are Christian counselors, that's what we're trying to do. Like, that's why I did the research that I did to try to show that there's evidence-based, we can use evidence-based practices that are specifically Christian-based and we can help people in counseling settings so that Christians don't feel like they have to step out of their faith um, if they're trying to receive any of those resources. So the first thing, the first question I want to answer is just that meditation itself is biblical. Uh, The first time it's found in the Bible is Genesis 24, 62 through 64, and it talks about Isaac. And what I love about this scripture is it just kind of says, he went out in the field one evening to meditate. So it's not seen as something extraordinary. It's not seen as, it's kind of seen as commonplace. As, as an everyday thing, like Isaac kind of went outside to do his meditation like he always did. I kind of read the scripture that way. And and then it, I love that script, the meditation often in the Bible is followed by blessings. It's followed by obedience. It's followed by surrender. Uh, it's followed by a deep connection with God. And for Isaac, what it was followed by is he met his wife. <laughs> That's a pretty cool thing. Um, It's a pretty cool blessing that came into his life as he was out there meditating one night. Um, But let's look at some of these other scriptures. Meditate on all your, I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I will meditate on your wonderful works. Keep this law, this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statutes. So the the word calls us to meditate on the word, calls us to meditate on God's character, who he is and where he is in our life. And so just understanding meditation is biblical. But what does meditation do? So there's lots of research that shows us meditation retrains our mind. So it actually helps the pathways in our mind to work the way we want them to. (laughs) Um, So it helps our our brain to make connections to things that help us to be settled, help us to be at peace, help us to grow, help us to work on acceptance and lack uh, and and stop uh, the judgments that we walk around with all the time, judgments on ourselves, judgments on other people. Um, And it helps us to kind of accept accept people for who they are, accept ourselves for who we are, and then be able to grow from that place. Uh, The cool thing is that is how we grow. 
We grow best when we feel loved. We grow best when we feel believed in. We grow best when we accept this is who I am. Now, how do I want to grow? Um, we don't do so well when we are pounding on ourselves, <laughs> trying to grow. And meditation helps us to be able to do that. Meditation has actually been shown in the research to be able to decrease a person's judgments of themselves and other people and to increase their acceptance and their willingness to make changes, which is kind of a cool connection. So what does it end up giving us? It gives us wells that are full. <laughs> it gives us wells that are overflowing with living water. So this is what we want wells to look like, right? We want it to be easy to pull out the water. We want to be able to see the water. And we want, it, we want to be able to push the pump and water just comes out. And when our well is full, we no longer feel anxious about giving, right? We don't feel anxious about doing things. We don't feel anxious about serving and giving to other people because we can see the water's right there. So if I need to pull some out, it's not a big deal. It, it doesn't create any anxiety for me to pull any water out. And it is a lot less work to pull the water out, right? Because you don't have to empty, you know, lower the bucket all the way to the bottom and try to heave it all the way up the well. You just take some right off the top. And that's what these spiritual practices that you guys are learning that's what they do they fill the well so that you can easily draw from it you can give to other people you have enough to do the things you need to do in your life and you're no longer anxious about that so what does meditate even mean <laughs> so there's several words in the bible for meditation there's hebrew words and greek words um, meditation is actually something that's found in most cultures um, so Meditation itself would have already been in the Hebrew and Greek cultures. And so teaching, telling people to meditate on the Bible that God told people to do through scripture would have been a familiar thing to them. And we'll talk a little later about the differences in meditation in Hebrew and Greek, but the word meditate would have meant something to them already. The word meditate isn't a religious word. It's a, a word that would have already been in their cultures. But the word meditate means to mutter, to ponder, to chew on the word. So I kind of think about it that way. Like it's a way for us to just kind of keep chewing on the word of God and keep seeing what other nutrients can we get out of this, right? We're meant to dwell on scriptures. We're meant to let them sit with us. We're meant to carry them around with us all throughout the day. There's so many scriptures on, on that, on talking about the scriptures and teaching them and pondering them and thinking about them. And that's what meditation is, is to ponder, to contemplate, to picture God's word and to carry it around with us, to store it up and then to claim it, to claim God's word in different circumstances in our lives, to be able to claim the promises that he's given us, to claim who God is. And you see characters in the Bible do that a lot, right? Where they say, God, I know you are the God who does this, right? Because, and then they claimed that. So I'm going to move forward knowing you're the God who does this uh, and remembering the things that you have done, because that's what meditation gives us. It gives us more access to God's word, because it's a way to carry it with us. It's a way to take it from our brain and put it into our heart. So one of the scriptures that I think about when I think about meditation, is think about the scripture in Luke 11, where it says an impure spirit comes out of a person. It goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there. The final condition of that person is worse than the first. So what that tells us is that we need to not just sweep out the negative things in our life, but we need to make sure we fill up with the right things. Because if we just sweep out the negative things, then we don't actually fill up with God. And so we actually make ourselves more vulnerable than we started out with. Um, and in this scripture, it tells us seven demons worse than the first come and take its place, right? And so we want to make sure that when we when we are kicking out negative habits, negative um, emotions, negative thought patterns, 
uh, from our lives, we want to make sure we're filling up with the word of God. Meditation is a vehicle to be able to do that. Meditation is something that helps us be able to empty out what's going on around us, empty out what's happening inside of us, and then fill up with God. So to be very intentional about filling up with God. One of the things <clears throat> I think, Otoma, you said that you guys read the book, The Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And one of the things that studied Donald, it, we devoured studied, it. Uh -huh. And so Donald Whitney, one of my favorite quotations about meditation, he is from his book. He says, meditation is the missing link between Bible intake and prayer. Too often disjointed, the two should be united. Typically, we read the Bible, we close it, and then we try to shift gears into prayer. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. If you've ever felt like I'm good at Bible study, but I'm not good at prayer. I'm good at prayer, but I'm not good at Bible study. And I, I hear people say that all the time <clears throat> because they're two very different things. Okay. So Bible study tends to be a very cognitive exercise. Prayer tends to be a pouring out of our hearts to God, wherever our heart is at, at that moment. And the Bible can really help us to kind of direct our prayers as great examples in the Bible of incredible prayers that people have prayed. But sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we're looking for things like context. We're looking for how do I understand this, which is important. <laughs> we need to do that. God's asking us to engage our brain and our cognitions in understanding his word and understanding his character. But then when we try to pray, we're trying to connect our heart to God. It feels like too much of a shift in our, and it is actually asking a different part of your brain to get in, engaged. And so it can be super challenging to make a switch from one to the other. Meditation is a great way to create a bridge between those two things where we can study the Bible. We can understand it. We can start to cognitively make connections about what it's about, then take some time just sitting with it, which is what meditation teaches us to do. Take some time to just sit with that scripture. Take some time to just let it be, to not try to understand it, but just let it be with you. So just let it visit you. <laughs> Have it over for tea. <laughs> just let it visit you for a little while. Then see what happens to your prayer life. When I first started looking into this, I actually started experimenting on my kids. <laughs> Uh, because I'm a psychologist. So that's what we do. <laughs> we try to understand behavior and see examples of it. So we used to always pray together as a family in the evening. And so we'd be busy, busy, busy throughout our day. And then, okay, kids, get your jammies on, you know, let's uh, brush your teeth. And then we're going to pray. And so we'd sit down to pray. And pretty much every night, the kids would say, thank you, God, for this great day and hope tomorrow's a great day. And, you know, just kind of this wrote prayer. My husband was like, we really need to teach the kids how to pray from their heart. And so he was giving them all these strategies and whatnot. And they were, they were definitely working. They were helping to get them to slow down and help them to try to understand we need to connect to God with our heart, not just kind of rattle through our day, but connect our heart to God. So then I started meditating with them. I said, you know what, let's just do a very brief. And I would do like a one or two minute meditation. Just take some breaths. Just we're going to center in on God. We're just take a moment to just be still Take a moment to just calm ourselves and connect to God. Like pay attention for a second to God. Pay attention to that's who we're about to talk to. And then let them pray afterwards. And I was amazed. I was amazed at how quickly they started praying from a very different place after just a one or two minute meditation before prayer at night. So it definitely works. That's my own personal little experiment with being able to observe other people in it. I definitely observe it in myself that I connect so much better to God. If I spend just a few moments in meditation, if I spend longer in meditation, then my, my prayer flows out of meditation pretty naturally uh, without even having to say, okay, now time to pray and switch over to prayer, but just kind of it flows right into prayer. Um, because I'm a lot more connected. My heart is more connected to God. So that's what meditation offers, is the opportunity to be able to do that. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. 
And so I think just look at what God's describing here. He's describing that well that's overflowing, right? The tree planted by streams of water. And what is he saying to focus on? He's saying to focus on his law. (laughs) We don't necessarily think about laws as something that's going to bring us refreshment, but that's what God's saying about himself. He's saying, meditate on, spend time with my law, with my word. You will understand so much more my heart. And when you do, whatever you do will prosper, Um, that you will be like that tree planted by streams of water. It's refreshing and it's growing and it's being nourished and it's flourishing. And so that's what God is offering us when we take time to meditate on his word. Through, Through meditation, we get to know God in a deeper, more personal way. And we get to begin to live that blessed life that he's prepared for us, right? Like he says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. We all love that scripture in Jeremiah. And this is a way to just get connected. Okay, what are those plans God has for me? Well, who is God? What's his character and what is my relationship with him? Meditation is a way to deepen that relationship that you have with him. It's connecting to God in deeper ways so that you can connect to what his purpose and his will for your life is. And so when you're walking in step with your purpose, I'm sure you've all experienced this. When I'm doing what I'm meant to do, I feel joyful. I feel light. I feel happy. I feel all the, even if what I'm doing is hard, even if what I'm doing is hard, I feel like this, I'm in the groove. This is what I'm meant to do. And so I feel good about doing it. And it feels right. And that's what God is offering us. Meditation is a way to connect to that. Because it's intentionally focusing your mind on God. It's intentionally focusing on his character, his deeds, his word. So the cool thing about meditation is it actually leads to transformation. It increases this understanding and insight and healing that we have. And I've seen that. I've seen that with um, myself. I've seen that with my clients that people have felt like, you know what, I was learning skills and I was getting better things. My symptoms were decreasing. But then when we started doing that Christian meditation thing, (laughs) I started getting way more connected to God. I felt like I started to heal. So there's a difference between I've learned more skills and I'm actually healing. Uh, Healing comes from God. Healing doesn't come from other places. Healing comes from God. And so when we connect deeper to God through his word, through and meditation is a way to do that, we get a chance to connect to that healing that he has to offer each and every one of us. We all need healing. (laughs) We all go through different things in life. And so just being able to connect to that healing, meditation is a way to be able to do that. Meditation helps us to love God more, helps us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have you ever read those scriptures and thought, how do, how do I do that? <laughs> how do I connect to God on all those different levels? He's asking for all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my strength. Meditation is a way to help us do that, helps us get more in touch with him. When we're more in relationship with someone, we can love them more. Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Meditation on the scriptures helps to facilitate and cultivate this transformation of our minds. So I love this. This is Zen proverb, but I love it because people will ask me sometimes, how often should I meditate and how long should I meditate for? And I love this, this little proverb. You should sit in meditation for 20 minutes a day, unless you're too busy, then you should sit for an hour. (laughs) And I think this is really, really true. When we get busy, we start to shed the things that actually fill us up. We start to say, oh, I'll do my quiet time later. Oh, I'll pray later. Oh, I'll connect to that friend later when really those are the things that would give us the energy to do the things that we're so busy doing, right? So, and if you think about it, I think you guys learned about Sabbath, maybe last week or the week before with Joel Pede. One of the things about Sabbath is Sabbath starts with rest, right? Which is so interesting. God says, I want you to start this with rest. So what I usually say to my clients and what I usually say to people in my life is that if you want to have a great day tomorrow, you your great day tomorrow starts with a great night's sleep, actually. If you get a good night's sleep, you can have a good day tomorrow. You can have the energy to do all the things you need to do tomorrow when you've had a good night's sleep. 
So whatever you have planned, the first part you have to plan is how do I fuel up? You know, you wouldn't start on a road trip with your gas tank almost empty and say, oh, it'll be fine. We'll we'll go. The first thing you would do is fill your car with gas, right? Then you would start on that road trip. And so we have to kind of think of our each of our days that way. What are the things that can fill you up and fuel you so that you can live the day you want to live today? And meditation is one of those things that just fuels us up for the day. These are some of the things that the word tells us to meditate on. I'm not going to read them all to you. You can see them, but just this idea that there's a lot of things God says to meditate on. They're all about him. <laughs> it's all meditating on his laws, his precepts, his promises, his unfailing love for you. Meditate on Jesus. Meditate on the character of different people in the Bible to understand how, to, how does my character become more like that. In practical terms, uh, the Jewish tradition of meditation involves speaking the scripture over and over. The Greek tradition call, calls people to, to contemplate on the scripture, um, to really think about what does it mean. But either way that people meditate or some combination of this, is that, which is actually the meditation we're going to do in a couple minutes, both of these require that you first just make space, make space to let scripture fill you up. Okay. So I always say, if you want to invite God over, you want to invite Jesus over to sit on the couch and talk to you, you first have to clear off the couch, <laughs> right? You got to clear off the couch and make space so that you can spend this time. And so think of meditation that same way. I want to make some space in intentionally in my life so that I can invite God into that space. And Jesus, I think, gave us the perfect example of why in all the busyness of life, it's so important that we meditate, that we pray, that we spend time with him, because he did that. In Luke 5, 16, if you read that scripture, it is in the middle of a super busy time for Jesus. He's doing a lot of healing. He's doing a lot of things are happening. And then right in the middle of it, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. <laughs> And I think Jesus knew that well needs to constantly be replenished. There's a lot of needs around me. And if I'm going to meet these needs, I need to be filled up on a regular basis. And so all the more we're going to have to think that way about ourselves. So find your quiet space. It can be anywhere. It can be a closet in your house. It can be a park down the street. I have a beautiful lake down the street from my house. That's a beautiful place to go and just sit and meditate bring a scripture with me and be able to just be with God for that time. But you could be like, I have a corner of my couch. I get up early in the morning and I, I have a little meditation there every morning um, when I'm, I get to be by myself. <laughs> um, so just find your space, but be intentional about it. Find a space that you really feel like I can get away from all the distractions of life. So now we're going to just spend a few minutes uh, actually practicing a scriptural meditation. We're going to, I've already chosen this scripture, but if you were to do this for yourself, I want you to choose whatever scripture you want for the day. But I figured today is Sunday. We get to go to Sunday service. We get to worship and we get to be with other people. So let's get in touch with this scripture. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay. So if you're able to, I would encourage you to close your eyes. Our eyes are very distracting. Our visual field is very distracting. So if we can get rid of some of the distractions, it's super helpful to us. Um, and just allow yourself to settle in to whatever chair you're sitting in, whatever couch you're sitting on, wherever you are, and just allow yourself to just be still. And just allow yourself to slow down. And just notice that you're breathing. Notice that your body's doing all the work it needs to do to keep you going. And you don't need to worry about it right now. That you can take this few moments and just reflect on a scripture. You can take this few moments and just be with God. The scripture we're going to focus on this morning is the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10. Just first start by just saying a little short prayer to yourself, just asking for guidance in the next few minutes as you complete this meditation, knowing that you're spending this time with God. 
can just purposefully shift your focus from earthly mindedness to heavenly mindedness. Letting go of rumination and worry and pivoting toward a single point of focus. The scripture we've chosen, the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Take a deep breath in and breathe out, repeating the scriptural phrase with focused, sustained attention. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you choose a longer scripture in the future, you may want to do half in one breath and half in another breath. But just repeat this breathing in and breathing out the scripture slowly and intentionally several times. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Your mind will inevitably wander to something other than the verse we've selected. When this happens, gently exercise a spirit of grace toward yourself by non judgmentally refocusing your attention back on the biblical passage. Breathing in and breathing out, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And quietly reflect on the passage. Notice the feeling that arises with this biblical topic. Ponder its meaning, how its message is expressed in your life. As you move from your brain to your heart. Just breathing in and breathing out the joy of the Lord is your strength. Again, if your mind starts to wander, remember this is normal. Simply return to the scripture phrase. Deeply experience the feeling that corresponds with this passage. And as you conclude, make a commitment to act on what you've just focused all of your attention on in a Christ-like manner. Say a short prayer to God, thanking him for revealing himself to you through his word, knowing it is always available to you. You can return to it at any point throughout your day, breathing in, saying the scripture as you breathe out, the joy of the Lord is your strength.
When you are ready, you can open your eyes, bring your awareness back to the room and to your surroundings. And just take a moment and just ask yourself, what was that like for you? Was it comfortable, uncomfortable? Whatever the answer is, okay. We're just starting where we're at. One thing I suggest is try adding a short meditation to your quiet time. So meditating on a passage from the Bible reading that you're already doing. I usually say start with five minutes. Get consistent with five minutes. And then increase it over time. The idea is to be consistent with any of the spiritual practices. The idea is first build consistency, then you can build quantity and quality on top of that. But first we have to build consistency. And when you first start learning to meditate, five minutes will feel like an hour. <laughs> um, and that's okay. That's okay. Just start where you're at and just build from there. Like how, long was our, how long was our meditation? Uh, that was probably five or six minutes. It wasn't very long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like about scripture meditation is that if you do it in the morning, then you really can throughout your day, just breathe in and breathe out. We breathe 22,000 times a day. We pay attention to very few of those. So you could harness a few of those to just re bring yourself back to the scripture that you had in the morning. Because a lot of times we can read the Bible in the morning and then by lunchtime, we've forgotten even what we've read. right? <laughs> and so if you can hold on to a scripture and breathe it in and out throughout your day, it'll really help you to connect more to it. I usually recommend that people stick to doing the same scripture for a few days, at least uh, with meditation, because I think it will help you to see how when you have this repeated exposure to the same scripture, how it changes that scripture for you, how it changes your relationship to it, how you start to apply it in your life in different ways, because it takes it from that, I understand it cognitively to it's in my heart and I'm living from it kind of place. And imagine what it would be like to do a meditation for, for an hour or for a day or for, like, to start to expand your idea of what meditation is. So a couple resources I wanted to give to you guys. One here is a UR code that just goes to my very boring YouTube <laughs> channel that just has meditations on it. That's the only thing on it are just some meditations that I've recorded. Uh, I use it in my practice to give people their homework. Um, and um, I use it in the church when we do different presentations on meditation just to give you a starting point in meditation so i think it's like six different meditations that are on there that you can use as guided meditations i think the longest one is uh pushing 15 minutes the shortest one is maybe eight so it's a good sort of 10 minutes that you can do to start to get you in the practice of meditation. The meditation we just did was a combination of a Hebrew and Greek meditation in the sense that we repeated a scripture over and over, but we also spent time in contemplation kind of saying, what does this scripture mean to me and how does it apply to my life? So it was a combination of both of those. Here are some books that are not all just about meditation, but are just Books that I think have helped me to slow down, help me to get more connected to God. Um, some of them are specifically on meditation. Some of them are just on spiritual practices or on recognizing God in the world in different ways than what we're used to. And it helps us to slow down. It helps us to see God in bigger ways. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys those resources as well. That's awesome. So I know we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see people, <laughs> because when I'm sharing the presentation, I can only see like two people. 